So uh, we're looking for a medieval castle and Renaissance Palace. First of all, huge thank you to the Castle Study Studies Trust for funding this, which is hugely appreciated. Uh, so we can have a look under uh, the driveway here to see what's here, looking for the old buildings. But also thank you to Alex and the Campbells uh, for indulging me, really, uh, and in letting me basically tr um, trudge around their garden uh, and generally just annoying them, really. So it's hugely appreciated. Um, the reason this place is important is what well, the family who lived here between 1159 and 1642, and these are the Keeps. So um, Keep is more of a first name these days, but as a surname, there's Keeps all around the world. It comes from these lands. The lands of Keeps stretch from here through to Humby. Humby used to be called Keep Simon. It was one little lordship until it was divided up in the 1140s or so. And over in Keith Simon at um, Humby, uh, where you had lunch, was where the Frasers started out. So anyone with the surname Fraser, that comes from there. And at the same time, there was a chap here called Gilbert de Umfraville. Um, don't really know much about him for the moment, but he was succeeded within about 10 years here by a man called Gilbert de Keith. So Gilbert, who lives at the place called Keith. And he is the progenitor of everyone in the world with the surname Keith. Uh, Keith either means wooded, uh, which seems appropriate, or it means windy, uh, which may be possible because there's a place over there called Windy Mains. Um, either or, I'm not a Gallic expert, so I couldn't tell you. Um, so the Keiths, they're relatively important. They start off, the first chap's called Harvey. He's probably Anglo-Norman slash French. Um, and his descendants go on to become one of the most powerful families in Scotland, at least until the early modern period. So they, during the Wars of Independence, they support Bruce. And after the Wars of Independence, they were based very much around here, but then they hoover up all sorts of lands which are confiscated or they marry into. Uh, so they end up with a huge East Coast empire, as you can see from this map. So they start off here at Keith Marshall, but they gradually acquire land throughout the coast. Huge concentration up in the Mens, so south of Aberdeen. Another one in Buckham in the far northeast. So it's said of the family that they could travel from Berwick upon Tweed to Cape Ness and even sleep every night on their own estates. You can see it's a bit of an exaggeration because they've got a bit of a, a gap in Sutherland, they've got a bit of a gap in Fife, but it's not far from the truth. And if they're by going by boats, they probably certainly can do it. Um, the height of the Earl's Marshal comes with uh, George Keith, the fifth Earl Marshal, who's how I got interested in all this. So I'm a historian, I'm not an archeologist. And I was doing my thesis on this chap who was a buddy of King James VI, he was the richest earl in Scotland. He founded the second university in Aberdeen called Marshall College, which is the big pointy granite building if you ever go up there to see it. He founded the towns of Peterhead and Stonehaven. Uh, he went to Denmark to marry Princess Anna on behalf of King James as proxy. And he did all sorts of other things. And he did a lot of castle building. But their principal seat you'll probably recognize, or at least after the Wars of Independence, is Donata Castle. You'll probably recognize this from your window screensaver from a few years ago. So this is a huge place, incredibly spectacular scenery, um, and it's just a great place to visit. Two things to remember about this. One, even though that's their principal seat, this is still their ancestral seat. So George Keith, the fifth Earl Marshal I was telling you about, he composes the first family history of the Keith. Uh, he got an awful lot wrong, but he did know the importance of Keith Marshal in the family legend. Also, he's in Edinburgh a lot to be at courts. The other thing to remember with Donata Castle is it's, if anyone's been there, it's a devil to get to because you have to go up a lot of steps. But they have another castle within a mile called Fetteressa with huge gardens. It's a lovely country villa. So even though they have one castle, they have another one nearby. And then another one, just to give you an idea of the scale of the family, is up here near Peterhead. This is my own reconstruction. There was a ruin there and it's not much of it left. This is in Barugi, which is up near Peterhead, another huge castle. And there's another castle within eyesight of this called Raven's Craig. So not only is the family having huge castles, they're having more castles next to their castles. The point of telling you this is one, to show you the huge wealth of this family, but also to say that this castle, uh, Keith Marshall, this palace, was counted alongside these other ones. So it is just as important uh, in the family records and things. So, um, this is a lovely house now, but it would have been much, much bigger, equivalent to Inverugi and Donata. That's what we know about the family. That's the kind of broad context. Very rich, very powerful. The Keiths um, sell up Keith Marshall in 1642 
during the civil wars. They come into uh, quite a few money difficulties and they sell up to the Hepburns, who uh, David's an expert on, and eventually the house passed to the hopes of hope, Hep, the hopes of Hopeton, and then various owners have had it since. But after the Keats go, of course, they've got a huge East Coast empire, masses of money. The Hepburns are quite powerful and reasonably important in the locality, but they probably don't have the amount of money to keep up a huge castle uh, as it was when the Keats were here. So we know the Keats are here from 1159 to 1642, but what do we know about the building itself? Well, in the grand scheme of Scottish records, we know next to nothing. Although we know the Keats are here from 1159, the first mention we get of this building is 1525, 400 years later. So you've got a huge chunk of Scottish history where we don't really know what's going on here, apart from the fact they own it. So they presumably are living here, they're presumably on the lands, but we don't know exactly how. And in 1525, when we get the description of the building, we only have four words, cum tare et fortalicia, uh, which is uh, basically charter Latin for with tower and literally fort. Um, it basically means courtyard, with tower and courtyard. Um, the Scots word is place or palace, which means a fortified enclosure. So we've got an idea in 1525 there is a tower here and a big courtyard. Obviously, we don't really have a tower or courtyard today. Uh, we have another mention in 1635 of the Tower of Keith Marshall, and we have various mentions of Keith Place, Keith Palace, the Palace of Keith, the Palace of Keith Marshall, and so on. So we know very little, and we only actually have two descriptions of the building before it gets to this sort of stage or this sort of stage. Uh, and this come, these come in the, 19, uh, the 18th century. One's later and shorter, and the other is earlier and much longer. So the later one comes in the Statistical Account of Scotland, and this is uh, in 1793 by the Minister of Humby. And he says that uh, the House of Keith may be mentioned on account of its hall, which surpasses anything of the kind, and was suited to the splendour of the family at the time as the most opulent and powerful in the kingdom. The house itself was in the form of a hollow square, and one entire side of it, 110 feet in extent, and three storeys in height, was occupied by a hall and succeeding proprietors have pulled it down. The timber with which the house was built was a present from the King of Denmark, as an expression of the high opinion he conceived of the Earl Marshal, uh, the fifth Earl Marshal, uh, when employed to treat for the marriage of Princess Anne of Denmark for Jean Keynes VI. So, this is quite remarkable. We've got a hall 110 feet, uh, a hollow square here. Of course, this is a knee-shaped building now, instead of a square shape. So, if we believe this, bits of it have been pulled down. This is reinforced by an independent description of probably the 1740s or 50s, only survives in a letter in the um, National Library. And this is a wonderful description of the building by the Episcopalian minister called um, Mitchell, Alexander Mitchell. So he's writing for a man called Bishop Keith, who is descended from the Keiths who lived here, and he wants to know about his ancestral seat. And Mitchell describes the house as follows, and it's summarised in this diagram. So this is basically what he's describing, and this is what I wanted the Castle Studies Trust to fund into looking into. So the dark bit here is what survives of this building here with the later uh, Edwardian and 18th century uh, additions. So Mitchell describes, there is a court, 24 yards long and 19 yards wide at the east end. So 24 yards long there, 19 yards long here. Technically that's not east. East is sort of vaguely that way. No, north is vaguely that way. So this is what he means by east, so he means along this side. On the south side of the court, there is a turret yet standing. Mm. When we go around the back of the house, if we go around the back of the house later, we'll see that turret, uh, which consists of three stories and garrets, so bits on the roof. On the opposite corner of the same side was another turret yet demolished, so that's over there where the kitchens are now. So there was another turret mirroring this one, which is now gone by the time Mitchell's visiting. The breadth of the house on the south side is only 15 feet, so that's over there. So the house has come out a long way since, but there are the old part of the house within is 15 feet wide. And part of the east side and part of the south side are all that's now in repair, so this bit here, which maps onto what we have left. The foundation of which is the old walls and bolts. Five of these vaults are still extant, but the court was vaulted all around. So inside that building are some vaults holding up the first floor but he's saying that there were vaults all the way around here. On the north side was the Marshal's Great Hall, which reached the whole length of the court and perhaps 19 or 20 feet broad without the court. 
So uh, roughly there, in the middle of the uh, oval of the driveway, would have been the wall which held up the Great Hall, is what he's saying. Uh, at least if these measurements are reasonably accurate. And so this is the Great Hall. What he means by 19 or 20 feet broad without the court is a bit vague. It's annoyingly vague. If the hall is the width of the court, that's 78 feet, uh, which is smaller than Mitchell's description later on, which calls it 110. So it could be they're mixed up. What it could be, though, is that 20 feet could extend the width of the hall, or it could be either side. So 78 plus 40 comes to about 110. So it could be the width of the hall is 110 feet. It may be a bit much. I mean, we can hope at least it's 74 feet, which is still very remarkable, which I'll come on to in a moment. So he says uh, on the north side is the Marshall's Hall. On the east side is the Porter's House uh, off the ground. So that's where the trees are there. And what he means by off the ground is a bit obscure. It kind of implies it's on stilts. But the Porter's House is over there. And then on the other side, over there on the driveway, is where the kitchen was. The inside of this wall, which is cutting across the driveway here, uh, is still standing to the joist. So when Mitchell visits, it's in ruins, but there is at least a big wall there you can see. So he can see the footprint of the building, even if he can't see exactly how it's used, because he's very vague about how the sides of the court are going. So within the court on the south side is a large scale scare, a stair about the middle. So he talks about a big, the scale stair is just like a staircase. And that would be roughly there, within the building is now. And he says there's a large turnpike at the east end of the north side near the port town. So there's a massive turret here at some point, the staircase, which makes sense because that's how you get into the hall. The outer entry of the court is uncertain. Whether it's in the east end or the north side, but he says it's probably in the east end. So he says it's over there. So he thinks the entrance is there. That may seem a bit counterintuitive considering the main road's over there and you've all come in the driveway there. But what probably is happening here is what's happening at the Earl Marshall's other house up in Inverugi is that he wants to show off his house so he makes you walk all the way around it before you can get inside it and in Inverugi you have to go right round it through one court and then another court and then round to the building and then you're into the building itself so that's probably something similar going on here and this is Mitchell's description overlaid on oh, overlaid on the ground so you can see where it is and that's really what I wanted the geophysics to describe, uh, to have a look into. So there's a couple of things to kind of remark on this. One is the two turreted arrangement you see here. That is quite a remarkable feature, and um, the best parallel for this is Drum Castle up near Aberdeen. So you can see it's got two turrets on either side here. So this is built in 1618. There's a date stone on that corner saying 1589. So that's probably when the Elmar, that's when the Elmar was in Denmark, but he may have added to the building once he's back. Drum Castle is remarkable, not only for the two turreted yeah. arrangement, it's smaller than Keith Marshall was, but also you see there's a massive tower in the background. So when Mitchell in the, 19th, in the 18th century describes this place, he doesn't mention a tower at all. Um, it's common in Scottish castles that if a family owned a place for a long time, they'll just add bits to it, but they like keeping the old stuff, because they can say, my great-grandfather built that, I built that bit, my dad built that bit, <laughs> and so they could just build up on these sort of things. And it's likely that the old medieval tower of Keith was incorporated into the later building. So you can see you've got the later range here, like you've got a Keith Marshall here, but you've got a whopping great medieval tower attached to it. So that's what I'm assuming is happening here. The other thing to note about Mitchell's description is the dimensions of the Great Hall. If 110 feet is the second largest Great Hall in Scotland. So the largest is Stirling, which is 126 feet. So it's only 16 feet shorter if it is 110 feet, which is huge. To give some comparison, at Edinburgh Castle, the hall is 82 feet, then Lithgow is 98 feet. So if it is 110 feet here, it is easily the second biggest hall in Scotland. Even if it isn't, even if it's only 78 feet along the length of the courts, that is still massive. So even though it's not as big as any of the royal halls in Scotland, it is still bigger than any of the uh, non-royal halls. The next biggest is the Earl of Orkney's Great Hall at Kirkwall, <coughs> which is made in 1606, and that's 56 feet. Uh, the Earl Marshall's other Great Hall <coughs> at uh, Donata is 55 feet, and Huntley Castle, and the Earl of Huntley is the Earl Marshall's biggest rival, that's only 43 feet. So if it is 76 feet here, that's still uh, a, you know, a good a third bigger than all the other Great Halls of these families. So we're looking at a huge structure here, potentially. 
And keep in mind, the largest room at Donoth Castle is the Long Gallery, which runs an entire length of a building. And that is 115 feet. So this is a map of the 1740s, roughly when or after Mitchell's visiting. And you can see there's a little sort of U-shaped building here with a turret on the back. The other turret seems to be gone. The steading isn't built over there yet, and there doesn't seem to be the driveway yet. So there's not a huge amount to see here. He doesn't describe any of the ruins, but he's probably just uh, mapping the things that are lived in. Um, one of the things I want to point out on this, though, is this little sort of feature at the end of the driveway, which is on the other side of the road. When you were coming in, you may have noticed a sort of suspicious lump with trees on it as you are coming in. Um, it's a big lump in the ground. Uh, I have no idea what it is. I would love to think it's like an old mot or an old moot. Um, it's not uncommon at the old Marshall's other great houses. In Verugi especially, there is a huge prehistoric mound within eyesight of the castle overlooking it in Raven's Craig. So this may be part of the old medieval, uh, the old prehistoric landscape, or a mot or a moot or something, which the house here is sort of um, having some sort of relationship with. But uh, it's worth pointing out. And it's also on this map of 1798, which shows it at the end of the driveway here. A U-shaped building here, probably not really describing what's going on with the house. Uh, the driveway changes, so it's wiggly now. It was straight at this point. You can also see there's a big avenue running out of the house, which does survive. Um, and so, keeping in mind, we've got lots of great map evidence from the 1740s. This landscape is still pretty pristine from then. So all the fields surrounding this house are intact. It's a very important um, 17th, 18th, 19th century landscape which survives here which even if the medieval castle doesn't survive here, this is an incredibly important historic site. This is a map from 1801, so the building is now E-shaped, like it is now. Um, and then when we come on to the next map in 1807, everything's much more recognizable as it is now. We have this oval driveway, and we've got the steading built over there. The thing with this is that means this driveway is a very old driveway. This is a 200-year-old driveway, which is quite remarkable. On the minus side, that means that you've got 200 years of gravel being replaced every 5, 10 years or so, which means there's lots of compacted ground, which does, you will see, has confused the uh, geophysics, which I'll come on to now. Rose Geophysics from Orkney came down and did two surveys here over two days, which the Castle Studies Trust did. <coughs> they did a resisti resistivity survey on the grass and a radar survey on the whole thing. Uh, and the results came up. I was hoping they would be like uh, the geophysics at Athenley Abbey, where you get a perfect <coughs> picture of the building underground. Unfortunately, of course, it's never that simple. But we do have a lot to be playing with. So, the survey covered the area from the, the, uh, the bush over there, I think it's rhododendron, up to that hedge there, up to the trees there, which would have covered the footprint of the building Mitchell described. This is the raw data. Uh, it's just a lot of blobs to me. Fortunately, Rose Geophysics very kindly have given a nice coloured version. So automatically on the resistivity, we have blobs up here, blobs down here, a couple of very suspiciously straight lines here. Now, one set of blobs is up there where there's the trees, so that could be tree roots. The other set of blobs are over there where the planting's been for centuries, so that could be tree roots. Um, there's something going on in the middle of the driveway they could have had a plant bush there at some point. So the geophysics team were very, very strict with me saying all of this could be plant. What we have, though, is two parallel features coming across here, which may correspond to where we expect that side of the court to go. We have stuff going under the driveway, which is exactly where we would expect the Great Hall range to be. And when that's laid over Google Maps, that is more or less exactly this half's so within the court, that half's a great horn. So that could be something. It might not be, of course. We also have this big chunk over here, which could be tree roots. But keep in mind, this is a fairly regular shape. We also have this massive feature coming off down here towards this building again, which could be a wall. We don't really have anything in here, which could mean there was nothing ever there. It could mean that there's nothing surviving there. It could be that if that is the entrance, as Mitchell's describing, there's probably not as much need for deep foundations. So that's resistivity. When we turn to the radar, though, things, we get a different picture, but also a similar picture in some ways. So I'm not showing you all the geophysics, sli the radar slices. 
obviously the one highest up has categorically proved that this driveway exists, which we already knew. But you can see even at, uh, up to about a third of a metre down, we have the driveway still quite clear on this map. Uh, we have a very strong feature over here, which is pretty exciting when I first saw it. Of course, that's just our patio, so that's nothing to get too excited by. The thing to draw out here is we have this feature up here again, under the trees, um, which you can see is quite regular, uh, which is potentially exciting. Again, it could be tree roots, but it is quite a defined shape. We don't have much going on along here yet, but when we go to the next depth slice, we have a bit more coming out of this range here, so under there. <coughs> We've got a bit more coming out along here, over there, which is exactly where Mitchell describes the court going. We also have that big feature carrying on underground, so that's a fairly heavy feature, and wonderfully, it's a regular shape. So the next slice down, we get to just over the half meter mark now. We've got an awful lot of stuff going on over here, which is probably just planting. Um, we've got a very strong feature coming out here, where we'd expect the range to go out. We've got a fairly strong feature over here, again, where we'd expect the range to go. Something emerging here, possibly, but that could be the driveway, so it could be nothing. We have on the next depth slice, as we're going further down, Keep in mind, the feature over there by the trees is getting less defined now. So it's going underground. It could be that it's just tree roots, which just happen to be in a neat line. Because um, when we come to the next image, that big square feature is more or less gone. We still have this coming out here. We have something coming out here. We have potentially something under the driveway here, which is where we'd expect the Great Hall. We also have a very regular feature coming out here and another one coming out here. The one that isn't aligned with the building is probably a drain. Even the one that is there might still be a drain. But it might respect the old line of the court. So there's potentially something there. The other thing is, keep in mind, there's all this disturbance going on over here, where all the planting is. Well, that seems to respect these lines. So it could be. There could be the secondary court over there, which could be cobbled and where you'd expect to find uh, the stables and so on, and the barns and things. Because you've got the main court where you have all your domestic ranges, but you want to keep your smelly horses away from yourself so you don't <laughs> smell the manure every morning. So it could be that's the service court over there. It's not conclusive, but there could be something going on over there. It is strange you've got an awful lot going on there and nothing on this side where we'd expect the building to be. And then the next slice down, well, we've clearly got a drain going on. Everything else is starting to kind of ease up. So that's pretty much what we concluded. Lots of blobs on maps. So that's where your money has gone for. So. I hope you get that quite a lot when you do geophysics. Yes. Excellent. Okay. My <laughs> interpretation of this is obviously this isn't particularly conclusive. We haven't got ranges, we haven't got definite building. One of the things to keep in mind is that Mitchell describes vaults going all the way along round. So we wouldn't have defined, necessarily defined walls, because you need just piers going up over the ground, over instead of one definite shape. I think there is enough suggestion of where we would expect the ranges to be from this to suggest at least three lines of the court. Unfortunately, I was really hoping we could say that, oh, the Great Hall is 110 feet long, therefore it's the largest Great Hall in Scotland. We, we've, got a nut, we've got a suggestion of a building rather than any sizes or anything. We do have that big feature over there under the trees, which I think is pretty exciting. If you cast mind, your mind back to the big picture of Drum Castle, with the castle, with the tower there, with the big range with the two turrets on it, that's what is exactly the same sort of thing going on over there. So I, I would love to think that's the medieval castle, or at least the medieval tower. When I say the medieval castle, of course, I was hoping the geophysics might tell us something about the long history. I'm interested in the Renaissance Palace here, um, but the Castle Studies Trust is obviously interested in medieval castles and going on through and how they were adapted over time. I was hoping we'll get something of the wider story, which hasn't <coughs> appeared to come up. We definitely seem to have the courtyard, but there is a big site here. So it could be the medieval castle. If the tower is there, the rest of the medieval castle is maybe around this plateau. If I was going to interpret the results and all the historical evidence, this is roughly what I would get. And this is my reading of this place compared to the Gale Marshall's other castles and what I know of Renaissance Scotland. Um, so this is what I think the place might look like in about 1600, based on all of this. So we have the existing range down here with um, a long range overlooking what would have been the garden. So we're pretty sure that the building comes out this way 
therefore the formal gardens are on that side, where they still are, which is, of course, where Uncle Sun is. Um, because of that, presumably, if a building is going to have a long gallery, you would have it in the top floor of this range. So that's where you'd have uh, the long gallery where you'd sort of congregate, play sports, overlook the garden, especially on a rainy day, as happens a lot around here. You've got the two turrets on either side. Um, I might be fanciful in thinking one side might be the Earl's wing and the other side might be the Countess's wing. And it was often once you've got your bedroom, you have a little study off the back of it, your closet, uh, where the Earl Marshal might have had his little library. So that might be the turret you might see later. Gateway, probably over there, like I say, based on Mitchell's description and the fact you have to come all the way around the building. Got the Great Hall. So you can access the Great Hall via the big turret there, which is described. And if you want to get to the Earl Marshal's wing, you go through the turret over here. You might have the service wing over there. You might have the old medieval tower over there, which you keep as a statement to your ancestry. After the Keith set up in 1642, it's a fairly useless building for anyone because the rooms will be quite small. Uh, it's not a statement to their ancestry, so they can just get rid of it. And it's a good use of stone. So that's probably one of the first things to go. Unless that is the porter's house described by Mitchell, which is off the ground. Um, so that's roughly my interpretation of it. Uh, I would love to know your thoughts.